Thanks very much. Yeah, it's uh, great fun to speak in the first of your presentation theory session at the students. Um, so I'm going to tell you about uh, well, the first chapter of a, of a new project that I started uh, in the last year or so. Uh, and I'm going to spend a, a few slides at the beginning here just trying to explain the big picture of why on earth we decided not to take this project and what we're hoping to, to learn from it. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone in the audience knows that whatever I say in the first two slides doesn't matter at all for the rest of the talk. And after the first two slides, it's entirely back to me, completely elementary again. Uh, so don't worry if I say words that sound bad. Okay, so well, we're going to study these things called bivalent categories in the room, but let's start uh, a little bit further back. So uh, why study tits of categories in the first place? Well, that's what we mentioned all time. Tensor categories uh, control you know, two-dimensional two topological field theories. Uh, so the, the the basic idea here is uh, what is a hypothesis proved by Lurie that tells you that certain types of topological field theories, that is the really nice ones that, that, uh, that associate uh, invariance to n manifolds, to n minus one manifolds, to n minus two manifolds, all the way down to some algebraic invariant associated to a point. Those sort of really nice topological field theories uh, correspond exactly with certain very nice higher categories. And in particular, in the two-dimensional setting, uh, if you want to assign vector spaces to, to two manifolds, categories to one manifold, and two categories to a point, then you're going to be looking at, at certain very nice tensor categories as the algebraic data that determine these topological okay. categories. Another thing to say about why to study, uh, well, maybe why to study fusion categories in particular, well, I'll say a little bit about what fusion categories are, is that, that, well, I guess I should say it right now, it's in parentheses right there, uh, a fusion category is a finitely semi simple tensor category. Uh, I'm making the word tensor there do a bit more work than it usually does, but we can talk about that at the point we need to. But fusion categories are a nice generalization of the representation theory of a finite group. Certainly, the representation theory of a finite group uh, is a category that's got tensor products, it's a category that's got duals. Uh, it's a, a semi simple category, and there's a finite list of simple objects. Fusion categories, in some sense, are not very far at all from representation theory of finite groups. But, well, while they, they're not very far, I think there's a, a good case to be made that, in some situations, they're, they're more important, than, I mean, they're, they're, they're relevant in ways you would expect the representation theory of finite group to be relevant, but something more, more complicated. So we're used, to, we're used to caring about group theory and understanding the representations of finite groups because we need to describe symmetries of physical systems and the representations of, of the group describing the symmetry of the system describe something about the, the, the particles you see in the system, the way they interact with the behavior of the properties of the particles. And fusion categories aren't necessarily representation categories of finite groups, but nevertheless, they still play the role of symmetry groups. Uh, but there's no group anymore. It's just a category that looks like the category of representations. So the, I mean, it's very much like uh, C-star algebra is being like uh, being like uh, being like topological spaces, but the topological spaces. Okay. So in particular, um, there's there's a whole lot of amazing stuff going on that I don't know very very much about. Uh, studying topological phases of matter in the condensed uh, condensed matter physics world, uh, but the really beautiful thing that happens there is that there are certain systems you see whose physics is described or maybe even well described if you're feeling optimistic by certain topological field theories, and those topological field theories in turn are, uh, are characterized by particular types of, of higher categories uh, and maybe uh, some two dimensional topological phases of matter for the standard fusion categories. Okay, in a different direction. Uh, explain why you should think of fusion categories as being uh, non-group-like symmetries, groups of symmetries without an actual group there, is uh, a little observation uh, from the world of subfactors. So there's this lovely gag of the, the hyperfinite 2 1 factor, doesn't matter if you don't know what that is already, but the, uh, one really amazing thing about it is that every single finite group acts on it uh, by, by outer automorphisms. And it, in fact, they act in an essentially unique way. And, well, once you've got this action, g on the hyperfinite 2 one factor r, 
you could produce this sub -value. You look at the fixed points of the group action R, and that's some sub algebra R, and this is some uh, sub landscape from the theory of one numbers. Now, you can look at uh, the bimodules uh, for this smaller algebra. Well, not all the bimodules, but look at the bimodules tensor generated by the big guy R. And that's some nice little tensor category. In fact, it's a fusion category. In fact, it's just a representation category. Okay, so very finite group. Uh, we can see, we can realize we have G as, as coming from this, uh, this sub vector. But something more interesting happens. Well, if you just take any old, you have to add an adjective here, finite depth, or whatever, but you just take any old finite depth sub factor inside of G and follow the same construction. You look at the AA bimodules. Well, really only those AA bimodules tend to generate by B, but those guys form. Fusion category, a unitary fusion category, because we're now in the unitary world of monomial algebras. You get some unitary fusion category, and in fact, every unitary fusion category arises in exactly this way as uh, as bimodules for some kind of sub And so, uh, I think morally, so sort of what we should be thinking here is that not only does every finite group act on the hyperfinite two one factor, every fusion category acts on the on the hyperfinite two one factor as well. And so in that sense. Uh, an of groups, more general notions. Okay. Unfortunately, now we're just going to pretend that everyone believes that it's important to understand fusion categories. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is something <coughs> poorly understood. Uh, so poorly understood that, uh, I mean, we, there are lots and lots of tools for describing the structures of fusion categories that we might hope that we have. Maybe Analogy to the finite group world, and we just we, we really don't. Have and I think at this point we're really at the stage of uh, phenomenology. We're looking at examples, we're trying to fit them into families, we're trying to see what's out there, and just trying to make guesses about uh, what the landscape of, of fusion categories might look like so that we can start conjecturing things and maybe one day prove something. Okay, so what examples do we have? What, what fusion categories are out there? And so I have a list here, and well, this is, I guess, a list of Unitary fusion categories. I can say what unitary is, but as I said, what matter uh, But I think we only really realized this just recently that the list of known unitary fusion categories is really strikingly short. Uh, and, and this is, well, okay, so there are these four points on this list. And maybe part of the reason why this is sort of a striking new thing is that we've recently discovered that a lot of other examples we knew about. Really fit into these four bullet points where we hadn't realized it was just extremely recently. Uh, the, a few extra constructions we hadn't understood very well, and now, now a lot of mysterious examples. Uh, that's what we so, what are the list? Well, you can take the representation category of a finite group, and that gives you a unitary fusion category. You can look at a, a quantum group, a UQG, look at it at the root of unity, and, and take the, the semi simple quotient, and that also gives you a, a, a fusion category. In fact, you need to so those are sort of two really big classes of examples that are connected with lots of other things, and everyone knows them lots. This, this other stream class of quadratic categories that people have been studying a lot recently, which managed to cover nearly all the other examples we know, uh, the theory is, is still pretty basic there, and we don't, have, we don't have a classification of quadratic categories or anything. We just have a mechanism for generating new examples and deciding whether some exist and some don't. And then there's this one guy Maybe it's two or possibly three, sitting all by their lonesome uh, with standard hardware of fusion categories that we just have no idea about. Uh, there's a construction of them, but it's brutal and, and uh, provides almost no insight. At some point, you just have to write down 21 strange numbers in some strange number field and start calculating it. At the end of the day, you say, Here's this fusion category. And really, that's not what's going on. Okay. So, we're kind of excited about this list. Uh, because it's really short. Are there other things out there? Uh, my guess is that probably there's tons of stuff out there, and this is just the first little little sign of a huge, enormous mess of just junk out there. That's the sort of best thing to do. And then we're only seeing this because we're just looking through a little microscope. Uh, but uh, perhaps this guy's unique and special. Well, <coughs> we don't know. So this one particular microscope has, has likely been the classification of the small index sub factors, but we decided we needed a new microscope. 
some way, some alternative way to look at the examples. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. We're going to do the time class. Okay. That talks a bit fast. That talks a bit fast. So what's the other thing actually talking about? Okay. Okay. So the idea is to study uh, divalent categories. So these are uh, tensor categories generated by a trivalent interface. So let's say exactly what this means. We've got some category C, we've got our favorite object X uh, in this category C. And along with that favorite object X, we've got our favorite morphism. We've got written in that little well, trivalent vertex there, which is just a map from X tensor X tensor X to the tensor identity of the category. Now, we also, when I said tensor category before and making tensor do a lot of work, I also want to have duality maps. So in particular, to make life really easy, let's just ask that our object X is dual to itself. Okay, so we've got some map that takes x tensor x dual, that's just x tensor x to the identity, and we've got another map that takes the identity to x tensor x dual. Okay. So, uh, and we, we want these to satisfy all of the simplest possible identities we can ask for, so duality behaves like a duality, straight and strings, uh, trivalent vertex is rotationally invariant, so if we build this diagram, so here, for people who haven't seen string diagrams before, uh, here, I draw a diagram like this. I mean, to just uh, read up the page, and as you pass interesting things, you use that map. So here we've got the identity, tends the identity, tends the identity, tends to this cup map. And then we apply the trivalent vertex map on the middle three tensor factors, and finally we apply the, the cap map from the duality here. And we end up with some different map, x tends to x tends to x. To none. Yeah. Okay, so I'm only going to think about, you could say that I'm only thinking about the subcategory of morphisms that I can build out of these things I've drawn by tens of the compositions. Okay. Yeah, the morphisms are generated. We need a microscope to go look for new examples. We're just going to start by, okay. Maybe the thing I should say is that, subject to time constraints, uh, we have a kind of general machinery for working out classifications of this sort, and the first chapter of this is running this machine on this first special case of trivalent categories. But if you want to do six valent ones, and if you want to do ones with one six valent and one eight valent satisfying some special relation, we can turn on many lots of things. But for now, we're just doing things as simple as possible. So, for example, when you rotate the trivalent vertex by one click, you're just back to this style. Okay, so. Every morphism in a trivalent category like this is a linear combination of planar trivalent graphs. So, for example, I've got some guy here, which is some morphism from two points to the bottom to two points to the top, and you can build this guy out of the things that I gave you. Um, now, uh, something like that. Okay? So that's a morphism generated by the computer. Okay. And because we're looking at a tensor category, the rule is just that any time you have two graphs which are isotopic by our planar isotopy, they're just the same ones. Okay? So really, we're just looking at planar trivalent graphs embedded in, the, embedded in the plane, and maybe there are some linear relations amongst them, and the tensor structure is the tensor category structure is just sticking back. Okay. Let's write C subscript K for the space of diagrams with K boundary points. So that's a typical element there of C subscript. Okay. Here's an example, and I think I'm only really going to talk about the example. Uh, take the representation category of SO3, take X to be your favorite object in SO3, the three-dimensional representation, and the trivalent vertex to be the determinant. You can quickly work out, thinking about SO3, what the dimensions of these, these home spaces in the category are. The zero box space is one dimensional, so this diagram, which has zero boundaries, must be some scalar multiple of the empty diagram. This must be some, some scalar multiple of the, the diagram that's the screen, and so on. So we have some structure constants there. Uh, finally, looking at the four box space, you can see from SO3 that it's a three dimensional space, the four diagrams have to satisfy a relation. And it's relatively easy to see that with this list of relations here, you could take any closed trivalent graph, use these relations to calculate its value as a multiple of the empty diagram. And that value would just be some polynomial in the structure. So in particular, the values of those coefficients completely determine any category, any trivalent category that have the same dimensions as SO3. Okay. We can look at, uh, we can do some little calculations 
collecting these diagrams together in different ways and evaluating them in different ways and quickly find that there are constraints on the values of D, B, T, and alpha and make some possible values we give you a diagram and so that's all for some there. And what we've just proved is that any trivalent category with a four box space of most three dimensional must look like this. You can work out the particular values of these parameters. In the example we really care about, SF3, of course, D, the dimension of our object X, is 3 for SF3. You work out the other values. And it turns out that everything else in that family of uh, trivalent categories with the four box space of most three dimensional, well, they're not necessarily the representation theory of SF3, but they're all realized by the quantum. What other examples do we have out there? Well, there's a machine for answering this question. If you give me a finite sequence of, of integers and we decide to ask what trivalent categories are there with the k-box space having dimension bounded by ak, we can go and look at what's out there. Okay. So the general idea is that we consider this map from the collection of all trivalent categories to, say, C3, and you can work out what the fields are like. Yes. But the map is just looking at some of the basic structure coefficients of the category, like the value of the loop, or, or the, the relations of turned up in this, uh, the, the, the coefficients of turned up in this related to the okay. Now, we've got a machine for determining uh, that some of, these, some of these structure coefficients are not allowed. And this is the machine. If the dimension of CK is against AK, but you've got some diagrams SI, but you've got more of them than, than is allowed, more than AK of them. You can form this matrix where you plug diagrams together in pairs and evaluate them. Okay, so we're assuming that we can evaluate all of these diagrams in terms of our structure coefficients, in terms of the coordinates of the C3. And of course, since we've got too many diagrams, this determinant has to be zero. And so this cuts out some self in C3, or whatever, whatever uh, our parameter space is, is that. So, the basic idea then is that uh, this cuts out some variety, maybe some curves, some points, some Space, and we know that all the possible trivalent categories sit on that variety. Then, at each point on that variety, we go back and should prove that certain local relations must hold uh, for any category that sits over that point in the parameter space. So, for example, we might learn that there must be a relation of this form that you can rewrite a pentagon as a linear combination of these simple diagrams, where typically we'll know these coefficients out from there in terms of our structure coefficients. We then do some uh, some graph theory, and start arguing that given the relations that hold, the, there's at most one category sitting over that point in the, in the parameter space. So the way we do that is just by saying that the relations we've got suffice to evaluate everything in the, uh, suffice to evaluate all those diagrams in the category. They completely determine all of the, the, the categorical operations. So for example, we've got a relation like this, you might just observe that any closed trivalent graph in the plane uh, has, a, has a small face uh, uh, that is a, a, a loop or a monogon or a bigon or a triangle or a square or a pentagon. That's just annoying the coverage of the argument. There has to be a small face. So if you had a relation like this and also some relations for evaluating smaller faces, you'd be done because you can take any closed diagram and recursively simplify it by applying the relations that you know must follow and, uh, and evaluate it. And that gives you uniqueness. That tells you there's only ever one category in there. Okay. So finally, realization. You've got down to some curves and points, some sub variety. You know that there's one category sitting over the point. You have to show that there really exists a category there. And typically, that's extremely hard and requires a, a different approach to really discover. Okay. So the final minute or two I have, yeah, minute I have, um, let me show you the tree of life by made on categories. So, Remember, this is only just a little branch on the real tree of life of tensor categories. We're just, uh, we've already looked at just those things generated by a trivalent vertex. It's as simple as possible. Okay. So how does this tree work? Well, every time there's a branch, you're deciding that some, some home space in the category is either small or large. So this first branch is saying that the, the space of diagrams at four boundary points is at most three dimensions. And our little theorem tells you, oh, the only things possible there are uh, SO3, or the quantum versions of SO3. This guy is special, but it's really a special case for this guy. And that's the one interesting for quantum computing you know, topological. Okay. Then there's a branch that goes off to the right. This four box space is large. And we know this branch is alive and well. I'll tell you tons and tons of examples that live off there. But we're just going to let that go off the page and not worry about it. We're only going to worry about the small trivalent categories for now. So we're 
So here's the case where the four box space is exactly four dimensions. Then we have some branch where we look at the five box space diagrams of five boundary points. And it's either small, it turns out less than or equal to 10 into the right measure of small, or large. And you see some cute things here over, over here. You basically see that everything comes in two families. There's two one dimensional curves and categories here coming from the point of G2 and some, some other strange category that no one had seen before, uh, which is, but it's not very interesting. It's a tensor product. It's a free product of some other categories. And then we go higher up, and we see another branch where we could either have the five box space be 11 dimensional or really big, where really big is greater than 12. And again, we just let that go off the page, it's too big, we can't say anything about that at this point. And you start looking at the six box space, and you turn left and say the six box space isn't very big. Lo and behold, you discover this very strange category. Uh, it's very direct equivalent to one of the categories in the Hagrup subfactor. Like I was only discovered a few years ago by a completely different sort of approach. But it shows up again uh, through a different microscope. It's not entirely the one. Okay. One or two things to say. While this branch is certainly still alive and well, there are tons of examples out here. The wild conjecture or wild hope that I have is that one day you could make an argument that in these trees of life, if you turn left a few times, you can never turn right again. That is, if you've put some upper bounds in some of the home spaces and said a few of the home spaces are small, it's exceedingly unlikely you'll ever find an example where some later home space is really big. There's no theorem like that, but uh, there's, sort of, there's a little bit of evidence that maybe that sort of thing happens. So I'd probably take a bet that those two branches going off the top of the directly dead. It's not there. We've actually seen everything. Well, except for this. this okay. Uh, what on earth does this tell us? Well, we discovered one new family of tensor categories by doing this. It wasn't a super exciting one. But I think the most, the, the really cool thing here is that we rediscovered, or we rediscovered a, a, a tensor category that had turned up in a completely different context. And maybe you can interpret that as evidence that through these two little microscopes, you're, you're, you're not seeing completely different views. Well, maybe that's just, just because we're both looking at microscopes in the origin, but maybe it's some evidence, a little bit of evidence that there's not. That turns out to be a really difficult part of implementing this. You end up with revenue basis calculations that become infeasible at some point. Another direction in which running this machine gets hard is proving more and more discharging style arguments. Uh, but so far, that hasn't been the, the, the critical step. All of the, we, we run into other problems before, before we get there. On the other hand, I mean, for sort of all of the first couple of discharging arguments out there, there is a tensor category sitting there. Uh, it's a coincidence of small examples. Any other questions? I was wondering, uh, I mean, is it possible to say that you have this sub variety and you have the categories living, some, some points have categories living above it, some don't, right? Yeah, I mean, typically what we do is that the, the machine gets you down to like a small sub variety that by the time you've got there, you're pretty confident that there is going to be something sitting over every point. Over every point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first step of the machine turns out to be wrong. <laughs> uh, so, although, I mean, for a while, we were wrong and, and thought we saw this extra elliptic curve in this, uh, in this space, which potentially had categories sitting over it. And a big chunk of this project was working out ways to get rid of that. It turns out in the, the final version of the argument. Uh, well, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thanks start again.